King Solomon followed David, and King David blessed him and said, you have a job to do, and that's to build the temple. And as he was building the temple, as he was doing this, you know, life sort of overwhelmed him. He made some decisions. And so when the Lord asked him, what would you like from me? He prayed, and he said, I want wise discernment, Lord. And so the measure of Solomon was in his wisdom. And in fact, we have a compilation of that wisdom in the Proverbs. And then as he reflected on life in the Ecclesiastes and in his young life, uh, also uh, just a, about what would wisdom mean and what does it demand? You know, a couple of years ago, I was at a conference, and there a psychologist had done a lot of research, which we see a lot of now in, in books and business books, about sort of the habits of highly successful executives. And he went on and on about these habits of highly successful executives, and, and they were mesmerizing. There were things that people were writing down, and all the people in the room were interested in these because they were things that were just so applicable, much like the Proverbs. But at the end of it, they had a question and answer time, and the question and answer time came up, and people were asking about the individual qualities of these habits that these executives had engaged in and how common they were among those who were successful. At the end of that question period, one guy raised his hand and asked this question, which was very insightful. He asked the guy who had done the study, do you practice these? <laughs> and the guy got very quiet. And he finally sheepishly said, no, right? You see, there's a difference between knowing something and practicing it. And Solomon is an interesting case study in that because Solomon had great wisdom, wisdom that helps us to learn how to live and to know how to apply knowledge to our lives. And in fact, when we're reading the book of Proverbs, which I've encouraged you to do this summer, you can look at those in those pithy little sayings. There's such wisdom that is there, very practical application for our lives. But oftentimes we see that Solomon, having that wisdom, didn't live by them. And in fact, as a young man, as he began to acquire that wisdom, there comes a time in his life where things begin to turn and he began to, well, the wheels began to fall off his kingdom, frankly. You wouldn't have seen it because it had continued to get rich and powerful, but the underpinnings were there. And it began with one word, and that word was pride. And when Solomon began to gauge in pride, it began to be damaging to everything else he had learned. And the very wisdom that he wanted to share with you in the Proverbs, he was not applying it to himself. We're going to look at that a little bit today. We're going to do that. I'm going to give you two scriptures. One comes from the book of Proverbs, and the second one from 1 Kings. And I'm going to give you a little setting around that, a little history. So let's look at the, the, the Proverbs first. It comes from chapter 16. And in this proverb, it, it says this. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Now I want to back into something and give you a little information before we get on with the second scripture. Last week I gave you five things that were sort of the overarching structure of the book of Proverbs. Because they come in different places, but these are five things that are repeated over and over again. When you look at these five things, they're principles that are, the book of Proverbs sort of guides us into. Let's look at the first one. The first one is this. The book of Proverbs is all about putting your heart's deepest trust in God and his grace. That was a foundational principle. In fact, very, the very beginning of the book of Proverbs, Solomon said it this way. He would say, the fear of the Lord or the awe of God is the beginning of wisdom. And putting our heart's deepest trust in God and Christ and His grace becomes one of the foundational principles for the book of Proverbs. But there's a second one that is found in a variety of different ones. It's this, submit your whole mind to the scriptures and let it shape who you are. You know, we turn to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 at that point, where it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. For when, when Christ came and gave us his grace, it's the scriptures that we put ourselves under, and it renews our mind and guides us in the way we are to go. That's another piece of the book of Proverbs. You find all these different Proverbs that relate to that. 
There's a third principle in the book of Proverbs. It's this, accept and learn from your difficulties and sufferings. We all got them. We're all going to have them. We're human beings, and we're going to have to face difficulties and suffering in our lives. And we might as well learn from them, because God wants to teach us in the middle of that. And in fact, what he doesn't do is pluck us out of all difficulties, but instead what he does is come alongside us in those difficulties and walks with us. That's what Jesus showed us when he came with his disciples, walking with them. And in the midst of life, difficulties and sufferings for each of them, he used that as an opportunity to teach them and train them. So we don't want to be people who simply say, I've accepted Jesus, I'm walking away from all of life's troubles, because that's not what God intends us to do. But instead we walk into the troubles of life with a different power and a different way of learning. The fourth one is a one that we also learn out of the book of Proverbs, and it's this, be generous with all your possessions. Be generous with all your possessions, and here's the corollary, be passionate about justice. Generous and passionate are two words that would be found for us because as we begin to live into what the Proverbs has to say, it's teaching us this. The last one is this. Be humble and teachable in your relationship with others. Now, we went over all these last week, but I want to linger on this one for just a second. Last week, I told you that, you know, we have a lot of interns that come through here that are seminary bound, and they're going to go be pastors, and I had a guy ask me a while back, how could I tell whether a pastor was going to succeed or not, and I said there was one thing that I have learned that is the difference between whether a pastor is going to succeed or not as seminary students, and it's this, do they have a teachable spirit? And I truly believe that. It's one of those things that the question is, can their hearts be taught? Can they go a different direction? Can, can they learn? Or do they, they solidify themselves and walk into a congregation and say, I know better than anyone else? If they do, they're going to blow apart. But that's not true just for pastors. It's true for all of us. And, and, and being in the place where we have a teachable spirit is one of the most important things we can do. Now, this is where Solomon began to have trouble because while he told us about this, when he began to practice it, his pride began to solidify him into a place where he could not learn from others. But instead, he believed he was in a place that were over others. That's why when he came to Proverbs and said about how pride is the beginning of destruction, he would understand that because the wheels came off for him in his, his kingdom. Let me show you one indication of where that happened. It's in 1 Kings. It's in his story. You can read the story of Solomon in the first part of 1 Kings or in Chronicles as well. But it says this. As, as you know, David gave him that job to build the temple. The, temp, the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the scripture says, was laid in the fourth year in the month of Ziv, in the 11th year of the month of bull, okay? It sounds like Dr. Seuss, doesn't it? But that's, that's just different names for those. In the month of bull, some of you have been living in that month for a long time, that bull thing, right? <laughs> Which was the eighth month. Living into the eighth month, that's what I'd say. But it, the temple was finished. In all, it's details according to his specifications. And in the scripture, there's a great deal of detail about how he brought the artisans together to build it. It was a beautiful, beautiful temple. And that temple was going to be the focal point of worship for all the kingdom. It was going to unite all the tribes, bring them together in Jerusalem. He spent a lot of time collecting taxes, collecting all sorts of materials, collecting the gold and silver that was be used by the artisans, and he brought it together in the temple, and there they built the temple. He had spent seven years, it took seven years, gathering all those things together, gathering the money from all the people to build it. See that? Triumph. That's at the end of chapter 6. I want you to see the beginning of chapter 7. It says this, it took Solomon 13 years, however, to complete the construction of his own house. And he used the materials that he gathered and he went out and he heavily taxed the people in, only, in order to build a palace for himself. We begin to see the disconnect from where God has called him to be 
and how he had begun to invest only in himself. And you begin to see Solomon turn at that point, and it's a big turn because he didn't listen to his own words. But we can listen to his words, and we can learn from them. As we go, we give thanks for the word of God. Let's pray together. Almighty God, I pray that you would teach us through Solomon, not just through his words, but through his example, because we can learn through both good and bad. Lord, teach us what it means to look at pride in the face and see where it begins to keep us from having a teachable heart. Lord, may we then apply your word to our lives and help us to know that in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at this, we begin to ask the question about pride. Pride is one of those things that the scripture talks about is the beginning of destruction. It's one of those things that we realize when it goes bad can have detrimental effect on our lives. It's one of those things when it solidifies in our heart can keep us from having a teachable spirit. And yet pride isn't bad, is it? I mean, at the end of the day, don't you have pride in your work? And don't you have pride in your kids and some of you? And uh, don't you have, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Don't you have pride in all the things that, are, that uh, have made up your life? The question is, when in the world does pride become a negative rather than a positive? Or is it ever a positive? That would be a great question. Well, the scripture would say, yes, it's a positive, and, and right, and applied in the right way. But here's when pride begins to go off the rails. It's when pride begins to be self-centered and sees itself as an idol. It sees itself as an idol. It takes God out of that equation, sets him to the side, and makes ourself the end of all things. For those of you who remember Watergate, you'll remember a character out of Watergate named G. Gordon Liddy. You'll see him every once in a while. And in uh, talk shows and other things like that. But when he came out of prison, they stuck um, microphones in his face and they said, what did you learn in prison? He said this, I learned that I can only trust one. And that is G. Gordon Liddy. That's the only one I can trust. It's the only one that's going to get me anywhere. It's the only one that's worth living for, for me. It's G. Gordon Liddy. Sort of interesting, isn't it? That's what pride will take you. It's when we begin to take a healthy pride and begin to see that as us and us alone that we've taken God out of the equation. But healthy pride begins to change the way in which we look at life. It is not simply our intelligence and our, and our abilities that get us there. It is God working in and through our lives. So we're going to be instructed today by a guy named Spurgeon. He was a uh, 1800, he lived in the 1800s. He was a pastor that preached all over England. And Charles Spurgeon was one of those that uh, has made a huge impact on the Christian community down through the years. He gave us a pithy little saying about pride. I want you to see it up here. It says this, be not proud of race, face, place, or grace. Okay, those four things. Be not proud of race, face, place, or grace. Now, here's, you've got to understand the context. Spurgeon is living at a time when the English countryside is people with people who are on top of the world. They have, a, they have their, their power has extended around the world, and the British Empire is second to none. Second to none. And what has happened to those with whom he's preaching, he has said, they have said, because of what's happened with the British Empire, we are the superior race. And he says, do you not understand that that has nothing to do with you? Who you are and who you were born to be has nothing to do with you. It's a gift of geography and your parenting. It has nothing to do with your superiority at all. And pride around race is, is something that, that just takes it, God out of the equation. The fact that we have something that we could be proud of, is something that's worthy of thanksgiving, not of pride. I'm proud to be an American, but I got to tell you, I had nothing to do with it. I was born into it, and it's not because I'm superior in any way. It's because God has gifted me with this ability to be in this country, and I'm thankful for it, and we can celebrate it. 
It's when I take it in and make it a, a point of superiority for me that we begin to get in trouble with this. And, and Spurgeon understood that about the British people at the time, and it's something we need to watch for because we take God out of the equation. It is a gift that we have. The second one is face. You all are beautiful people, most of you. <laughs> Some of you have worked hard at it. But your bone structure, who you are, all that, that's a gift, right? We didn't have anything to do with it. It's what God has given us. And for those who have taken their beauty and said, this is my source of pride, let me tell you a little secret. One day, it's going to fade. <laughs> now, for most of you, it hasn't. I just want to clarify that so you won't come back on me. But it is. And for those who have put pride in their beauty and that's the only thing they have, what they've done is they've said, I am the center here. You might go to God and say, thank you, Lord, that you've made me the person I am. It's a point of celebration. And most of you could go and say, thank you, Lord, that you have made me and made what I look like. It's a place of great pride, but it's mostly thanksgiving because pride begins to take us out when it's in these things how about place for many of you you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth as your parents handed you the fact that i have an education really has very little to do with me it's my parents invested in those things for me and it was a gift that was given to me and i can be thankful of it but it's not a point of pride for that okay what about grace? Grace is a gift. The fact that you're here in this room and are celebrating the Lord of the universe and you're one of his children is because God has given you that gift. You see, be not proud of race or face or place or grace is a wonderful way to begin to think about where does pride go off the rails. For Solomon, it was right there. So what are we to do? Is pride something that when it shows up in our hearts, we're to simply banish? And the answer is absolutely not. Pride in its proper place is one of the greatest things that can happen to us and our kids, right? What we want is kids who have great self-images, that understand themselves in the grace of God and, and, and feel strongly and good about the things that are there. So what do we believe and what do we put pride in? Well, I'm going to give you two things that I think are important. The first one is this. We put pride in the application of our gifts. God has gifted you richly. And when you apply them well, then my hope is that you feel great pride in that. When you work hard, this is why when someone graduates from high school, we bring them across the stage and we're clapping for them. Why? Because we believe they've applied their gifts well. When they go to college and stand before it, they've worked hard to accomplish the things they've worked for, then we believe it's, it's worth pride. It's a pride. I was, I was at one of the uh, big box stores the other day, and one of our students out of our um, out, out of our congregation was there, and he was working there, and he had, he had become a manager, and um, we were talking together, and he had come into my office a couple years ago, and boy, just things were falling apart for him. And he was lowering the snake's belly, as we say in Texas. <laughs> he was lowering the snake's belly. And we began to identify the gifts that were in them. And we talk, I talked to him, and I said, how are we going to apply it? And I had the opportunity to coach him through that. And, you know, years later, he found himself as a manager. I just happened upon him in the store when I was going to buy lumber. And he came around the corner. And he said, let me tell you what's happened to me, Larry. And he talked about this rise to management position in his job. And I turned to him and I said, I am so what? I am so proud. And I knew I was going to talk about that the next day here. But I was so proud of him. You know why? Because he had taken the gifts that God had given him. Remember, God was the source of that. And he applied them well. And that's a source of pride. One of the things that we need to do as parents and grandparents is we need to understand when we praise our children, 
What are the best ways to praise our children? The best ways to praise our children is for the application of gifts. If you praise them for their beauty, they can't change that. But if they, you praise them for how the way in which they've worked hard or done something good, that encourages a child to take those gifts and apply them even deeper. The second thing we're to be proud of is the exercise of character. The exercise of character. I've told you uh, about Kelly, my daughter. I, I, I'm so proud of her. I'm so proud of her. But one of the gifts we identified early in Kelly, which was uh, sort of, uh, she just kind of had it in her heart, and that was the gift of compassion. Kelly has the gift of compassion. And, you know, now she's working in a psych hospital, and she comes and teaches, uh, tells us a little bit about stories that she's experienced there and stuff like that. And I can watch her compassion be used in her job. And I said, Kelly, you have to go into the hard places. And she said, yes, and I love it. Right? And here's what I said. Kelly, I'm so proud of you for your exercise of that character that God's given you. You see, is there bad pride? Yes. And the Proverbs is sure that when it becomes the center of our lives, we can go off track very, very easily. Is there good pride? Absolutely. Because God has given you gifts, and when you invest in them well, you should be proud of what God does through, in and through you. But remember, and hear my language, at the very center is not ourselves, but the God who stands behind all the universe and calls us into existence. When we go to this table today, we come not because any of us deserve it, not because we demand it. We come because it's just a point of grace. It's a free gift that will be freely given to you. When we share together in that bread and that cup, we do so recognizing that God pours that out on us. And then as we take it into the world, we have the gift of pride as he works in and through us. Let's pray together.